So rather than to actually leave or attempt to talk to other guests, Chani sits by herself and shoves handfuls of jelly beans into her mouth. As an awkward introvert, I get it. But at the same time, my sympathy for her is pretty low because, as I said, literally nothing is stopping her from leaving. Hello and welcome to Procontation Points Video Snark. If you came here because you thought that this was an audiobook, please stick around and maybe learn some reading and listening comprehension skills. I read books and discuss what went wrong and how they can possibly be fixed. I'm continuing my read-through of Funny You Should Ask by Elisa Sussman. Not the first video, go check out the others. Links are posted below. This section is then. Woo, can't wait for more foreshadowing for stuff that has already been explained to us. Chapter 19. Exactly as I had predicted, we open on more stuff that had been explained to us, it, except that this time it's basically rehashing what we literally finished reading in the third installment of Chani's interview with Gabe, about how she'd woken up hungover the night after the premiere and Gabe started texting her. We literally read all of this a chapter earlier. We didn't need the minute details of how terrible Chani's hangover was. We're subjected to about a page of Chani being hungover, and then she thinks about how she got home last night, none of which is actually important, mind you, and then Gabe invites her to the other party, but tells her that she can bring her tape recorder. Because I had completely forgotten about the article, the whole reason Gabe was speaking to me in the first place. Obviously, he wanted me to come over so he could dazzle me with another element of his glamorous life, which I would then put in the broadsheets piece. Honestly, the biggest wish fulfillment in this book isn't a fangirl hooking up with her celebrity crush. No, it's the fact that Chani's self-absorbed article where she wrote about herself hanging out with Gabe for three days somehow landed her fame in a book deal. I promise you that if a real reporter tried to hand over what Chani wrote and claimed that it's an interview with Daniel Craig to promote the next James Bond movie, that reporter would get laughed at. It would probably be unprofessional to go to the party tonight. This is literally the first time in over 200 pages that Chani has once mentioned how freaking unprofessional that her relationship with Gabe is and was. It's not that I think she's wrong. I simply think that it's laughable, especially considering that we already know that she went to that party. And it didn't stop her from going to Montana with him either. So she gets ready for the party, and I... I checked myself out in the mirror while also practicing how to graciously turn down the cocaine I assumed would be offered. No thanks, I said to my reflection with the toss of my hair. I'm already totally high. I feel like the author herself was high while writing this. Yo, this is from a published book. When I'm placed in the top 20 for romance novels on the 2022 Goodreads Choice Awards, people actually read this and thought to themselves, ah yes, peak literature. Why? What is up with this book that so many people like it? Chani is kind of surprised that the scene at Gabe's house is exactly like any other party she'd been to. No drunks passed out on the lawn, no signs of a huge party going on. Is she comparing it to frat parties by any chance? Inside, Ollie greets her warmly and starts asking her for her alcohol presence. Chani makes a fool of herself by assuming that he's offering her cocaine. I took psychic damage from reading that bit. Chani also assumes that when Gabe said that there would be games, that it meant <laughs> bedroom kind of games. This girl is jumping to so many conclusions, I think she's now qualified for the Olympic pole vaulting team. And then Gabe is there, and literally everything else fades away in Chani's opinion, including Ollie. They stare at each other for a while. Chani feeds the puppy some cheese. Was the cheese really necessary? No more necessary than rehashing the party that we learned about in the previous chapter. Bonus chapter 22. Today's article is about how Gabe took his mom as his date to a movie premiere, about how he'd said in interviews how close he is with his sister. One has to wonder how Parker manages to maintain his undeniable masculinity while surrounded by so much femininity. Well, it was probably only a matter of time until the toxic masculinity showed up. The only thing that surprises me at this point is that it hasn't reared its ugly head until right now. The reporter said that since Gabe refused to tell anything about his father, he did some digging on his own. Found out that Gabe's father, Thomas, was a contractor who married Elizabeth when they were both 27. They had Gabe's sister when they were 29, and Gabe followed a year later. And then Thomas was dead 10 years after that from a brain tumor. Which, wow, just wow. How unbelievably insensitive can these reporters possibly be? Chapter 20. Despite Ollie telling Chani that nobody was doing cocaine, she was still under the impression that some people in the corner were doing it anyway. I kept a fair distance from them. I still wasn't sure of the cool way to refuse. I legit don't know how to explain to people that the entire peer pressure to do drugs your dare officer tried to warn you about literally doesn't exist. Nobody is going to force you to snort cocaine. If, and that's a really big if, they ask, the only thing you need to say is, no thank you, and then leave. 
What's worse than Chenny's drug paranoia is that Gabe bounced on her, leaving her alone at the party with people she doesn't know. She also felt like he'd only told her to bring her recorder as a joke because he clearly didn't want to be interviewed. So rather than to actually leave or attempt to talk to other guests, Chenny sits by herself and shoves handfuls of jelly beans into her mouth. As an awkward introvert, I get it. But at the same time, my sympathy for her is pretty low because, as I said, literally nothing is stopping her from leaving. My head felt heavy and wobbly, but I was determined to keep it upright, even if I had to rest my hand at the base of my throat, using my palm to stabilize it like my neck was that slippery, unsteady column of birthday cake in Sleeping Beauty. This novel was nominated for a Goodreads Choice Award, everybody. Never give up on your dreams. Not only did this garbage get published, but enough people liked it to nominate it. But as Chani convinces herself to leave, Gabe comes in and says that it's time to play a game. Chani still feels terrible following the night before and wonders how it is that people can keep partying night after night after night. She looks around at the other guests, who are a mix of young and old. She describes the older ones as looking exhausted, like a warning to the others. When Gabe announces the game, all of the older ones go out for a cigarette break. Gabe divides those left over into two teams and makes sure that Chani is on the team with him. He then tells them to write ten things, but doesn't explain what those ten things need to be, much to Chani's confusion. He offers to write her list instead. Chani is pretty drunk as Gabe leads her to the other room. She keeps insisting that she isn't drunk, which, unless those jelly beans were alcoholic or something, I don't know how one sip of whiskey and coke could have possibly made her be like this. The game starts with a random girl who runs out from the room and then runs back in and starts singing the Golden Girls theme. The one who guesses that name of the show runs from the room, comes back in and says something about Ginger Rogers. The others complain that Gabe isn't playing. He has this to say. Gabe laughed. I'm just teaching the newbie how to play, he said. Except that he's not teaching her anything. He's literally standing there watching the other people run around. Chani understands the game about the same after seven rounds than she did after the first. They kind of stand around until it's Gabe's turn. He then says something that makes Chani blurt out, Woody Allen. Then it's her turn, and Gabe guesses her clue. And then, mercifully, the rest of the game is really, really quickly glossed over until somebody declares Chani as having won. Bonus chapter 23. More from Chani's blog, which at this point at least is not her describing the most basic way to do a jigsaw puzzle. No, instead it's her info dumping about how when she and Jeremy play a game called Perfect Day, which is more of a hypothetical thing piece than an actual game, but whatever. And then because this novel wasn't bad enough, we actually have to sit and endure her describing not only her own Perfect Day, but also Jeremy's. I'm seriously debating on if I even want to bother summing up both of them for you. I mean, that is... Was this really necessary? Does anybody care about this? But much like everything else in the story, the author thought that we cared. Does it add anything? Much like everything else in the story, no it does not. It rambles on for two pages before stopping. Thanks for listening to my book snark on YouTube. New videos are up every Monday, but stick around because I sometimes drop random videos on other days too. Just as a reminder, even if you can't financially support me, there are other ways to help me out. The first is watching this video as well as all my other videos. It's also important to like and subscribe. Finally, you can share this video with all of your friends so that they can help as well. If you're already caught up with all my videos, you can go to Tumblr for my main book snarks, always free and updated every morning. And if you've already read all of my main snarks, then you can find even more snark on my Patreon. You can access it for $1 a month. Members also get early access to my main Tumblr snark. Special thanks to Dawn, Phoebe, and Nikki for supporting me on Patreon already. If you want to hear your name in my video next week, either support me on Patreon or make a one-time donation. Do you like my snarks so much that you want me to snark your writing? I do that too. For just $6 per chapter, I will tell you how awful that your writing is. But not to worry if you feel like you couldn't take the criticism. I also offer regular book editing as well, just $10 per chapter. You can contact me on any of my social media platforms if you have further questions. If you want to read some of the things that I've written, you can purchase my works on Amazon. I have a slew of erotic short stories and two full-length novels. I also frequently run flash sales on my stories and if you don't follow me on any social media, you might want to do so just so you can know when I might be offering things for free. Links for everything will be posted below. See you next week, guys.